Every day you wake up as your own boss, making your own way. Every day you continue your journey to change the world, your team and yourself. Every day you encourage, congratulate, celebrate and reach toward your goal of being the best and providing the best. The Build Your Best Business Show is for you. The real stories of building a business from other owners and founders along the journey. Find the support and advice you need to successfully start, grow, manage, and exit your business. What are you going to do today to build your best business? Welcome to Build Your Best Business. I'm your host, Eric Holtzba. Build Your Best Business focuses on the entrepreneurial journey. What does it take to successfully start, manage, grow, and exit a business? Today, we're talking with Andrew Goldner. He is a founding partner at GrowthX. So I was telling him before we came on that I started a company back in the day called NoX. Yeah. WX. We went through a lot of iterations of that name before we landed on NoX. So tell yeah. us a little bit about what uh, GrowthX does. Well, GrowthX is about building companies. And then that's the name. And, you know, we believe that we live in exponential times. And so that's where it comes from. Okay. Yeah. You know, we're founded as venture capitalists. We're prior operators, entrepreneurs, and now venture capitalists. But rather than wanting to just write undifferentiated checks, we wanted to figure out how to actually be helpful to the founders and help their company grow. Um, and in the age of applied technology, where building a product is easier than selling a product, that's just where we'd like to get in and help, is helping good product-focused founders understand how to solve market needs. And that is an interesting transition, because you and I have a similar and varied background. Yes. And back in the day, it was harder to build the product than yes. it was to sell it. Data yeah. centers and technology that had to be kind of cobbled together, but you're right. I mean, you, you can stand something up from a technology perspective pretty quickly. Yeah. Then does somebody want it? Are you building the right features? How do you get it to market? Those challenges are much greater. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We think of it as the age of developed technology. If you're thinking of Silicon Valley where we started our fund, and you go from Hewlett and Packard until roughly 10 years ago, the challenge was that products were expensive, yeah. complex, and the talent was rare. Right. And needing to be proximate to each other and the science at Cal or Stanford or even a jet propulsion or national laboratory made sense. Right. But if you flash forward to today, where products are cheaper than they ever have been to build, the technology is less complex than it ever has been. And thanks to coding boot camps and computer science degrees, and you know, let's be honest, to people like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, who really got a generation of people thinking about this opportunity, Technology talent is plentiful. So flash forward to today, the reason that companies are failing at the earliest stages is not that the products don't work, it's that they're not solving a market need. And so that's what we call the age of applied technology. And that's, again, obvious exclusions, science, right, absolutely. hardware, other capitally intense business, and that stuff is still happening and it operates in the age of developed technology. But the reality is if you look at the most of the entrepreneurs in this town or even in Silicon Valley, they don't need access to a jet propulsion laboratory. Right. They're taking a line of code and, and applying it to a new problem. Yeah, it's a very interesting interesting time to be looking at it that way. Cause, so, so talk about your background because I do want to get into you know, how you help solve that problem. But sure. You said that you were an entrepreneur and some of your other partners were operators. Yeah, yeah. And so then making that transition. So my journey, um, I've been in technology for about 20 years and I actually started out as a technology lawyer. So I was working with early stage founders kind of in the first internet bubble in the late 90s, helping them as their counselor. Um, I understood and loved the technology, but I was a practicing lawyer and decided to combine the two. And so based in New York, um, had the pleasure of, of working at a large New York firm that was building a technology practice group. So I got to only work on technology deals. Oh, wow. yeah. And so that uh, gave me a really wonderful opportunity to work with some of the early pioneers, um, whether it would be uh, ICANN, 
the International Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers and setting up the whole um, TLD and CCTLD and uh, the top level domain system for URLs, um, whether it be working for you know, Alta Vista, Priceline, Salesforce, Vista, I heard that yeah, that exactly. <laughs> I, when I'm talking to young founders now, they'll kind of be like glazed over on that one. <laughs> but they, they certainly know Salesforce and, right. and, and Priceline and Yahoo, a lot of Silicon Alley because I was in New York, but yeah. I spent a lot of time servicing the clients uh, that were on the, on the West Coast. Yeah. And like a lot of lawyers, I then transitioned in-house. I went to DoubleClick. Uh -huh. I, I, I was working on a lot of new media. Um, I was at the forefront of some of the earliest interactive advertising with a client that was in the music business, and it gave me the opportunity when interactive advertising was just starting to be working with Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and Mandy Moore and Britney and helping them figure out how to use the internet to bring the band and the fan closer together. So registering BackstreetBoys.com and then figuring what to do with geolocating on an interactive banner that could show a zip code kind of call. Um, and so went into DoubleClick um, and, and worked with them for a little bit. Um, and when we went private and sold to Google, that's actually when I went to the Thompson family. Okay. Um, started doing sophisticated fintech transactions. The Thompsons are a very entrepreneurial family, so even though it was a big company, it was very entrepreneurial. Right, I like right. I, I joked around that I was an EIC at Thompson, an entrepreneur in captivity. Yeah, well, and they did, and, and you and I shared one of a couple of companies I started in the '90s were uh, seeded by kind of their entrepreneur. There wasn't a yeah. certain, such a thing, but. And the way they would do it is they would build the company and pretend like it didn't exist. Yeah. And if it was good, then they would acquire it. If it wasn't, they pretend like it never happened. Right? That, so it was a way for them to test. Yeah. There was this whole concern about what was the internet going to do to our brand? You know, was it really an ex was it real or sure. was it going to be you know just a fad? So very interesting. That's right. And, and you know that law background. I've worked with lots of entrepreneurs who have that law. It's a very good background for getting into the entrepreneurial space. It's I, how you guys. It it it's um it really is a great journey to um, get into entrepreneurism or an operator at any stage, um, especially if you're doing transactional type of law that I was doing. Um, it really helps build a muscle mass in the brain that it's difficult to, um, to build otherwise but, and, and certainly not to do it intentionally. And so it really is about the practice of law, you know, learning the art of negotiation, you know, choosing to be a deal maker and not a deal breaker. Yeah. So it's how to build oh, something together. Such a, people say things on the show and they don't really be a deal maker, not a deal breaker. And you have to you have to focus on that when you're working with your lawyer. Sometimes the lawyer is more of that deal breaker. They're trying to come up with all the reasons why you shouldn't do the deal. You absolutely do. Versus working at like how do we make this work? And I, I mean I actually have to give credit to that. My first class ever in law school, my first professor, the first five minutes of law school for me in property class. That was the first thing out of his mouth. He's like, "This isn't going to make sense to you right now, but I'm going to plant the seed." And this is going to occur to some of you later, and that is you're going to need to decide what kind of lawyer you want to be, a deal maker and a deal breaker. And that really has just struck with me the whole time. And, and I have to say that as a, as a counselor, as a lawyer, I always sought to sit as we are now on the same side of the table when doing a deal. I didn't think it ne needed to be antagonistic. It right. didn't need to be us versus you. When you approach things with an attitude of abundance, and not an attitude of scarcity, then the same set of facts that would present otherwise as a challenge you see as an opportunity. Yeah. And so you can work together. And that's very much what we're trying to do at GrowthX with we work with founders. We don't even buy into the uh, premise of funders needing to become more founder friendly. We don't even think that's the right way to set it up. It's not a, it's, it's, that's not the right paradigm at all. You know, we're working together from, you know, the first conversation, we believe on an equal playing field with the founder to explore how we can be helpful and to express our gratitude for the opportunity to learn about what they're doing, to meet who they are and see if through helping, we can ultimately maybe build a relationship and work together. And, and so, you know, my mentors and the partners that taught me how to be a good lawyer really helped me understand how to do that. And then the point you were making earlier, 
spending time sometimes at a big law firm, 10, 12, 15 hours in a row negotiating a deal. And when the clients and the bankers got to go out to a fancy dinner <laughs> and I get sent back to what I called my billing station <laughs> and I had to memorialize into a hundred and some page document. When you go from soft copy to hard copy, yeah. where everybody else saw a period, you see a comma. Yeah. And they really hadn't thought through things A to Z, even though it, it seemed at the time that you had. And it's that muscle mass that I really like uh, exercising work and helping founders um, in a very stage relevant way, uh, you know, think about how to for us now, go through the formulaic kind of process of market development. And so, yeah, those early muscles really helped. Well, and, and, and said maybe a different way, and correct me if I'm wrong, but thinking about it with the end in mind. And yeah, so I'm many an, entrepreneurs don't do that. They well, get So that's, get that is a very smart point. Right. And, you know, happy to get into this as deeply as you want, but it's especially relevant in the micro hubs, the wonderful micro hubs like Nashville and Chattanooga you know, like Cincinnati, like Kansas City, like Milwaukee, as different than a Silicon Valley that has such a predominance of professional venture capital and a little more awareness among the founders that if you're choosing to be a venture-capable entrepreneur, which is only one type of entrepreneur, and that's a whole subject as well I'd love to talk about, but if, if you're choosing to want to be big fast and you want to be venture-capable, then understand that before you've raised your first round, you're setting forth in a game of chess, not a game of checkers. Right, absolutely. It is definitely a game of chess. And you yeah. need, as you were just saying, you need to be thinking many steps ahead and knowing the end game, and being thoughtful and intentional about what your objectives are and being open and obvious and transparent about those and staying focused on working your priorities and not working someone else's priorities and understanding that the people who you're working with are hopefully good people but they just might not have the right and same agenda yeah. and then how do you think through from this point many many steps ahead to make sure that you're building a company in the way that's going to take you in the direction that you want to go and that it and it's a journey that you want to have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's some of the worst things I talk about founders, specifically when founders get together and they say they want to go skiing. One person thinks of water skiing and the other thinks of snow skiing. So Great. They show up at the car with two totally different sets of things. You got it. So we're going to go to our first commercial break and when we come back I want to talk a little bit about the transition from going from one side of the table of being the entrepreneur and operator to being someone who started to decide to put money in yeah. why you decided to do that, what that Great. looks like. Uh, so we'll be back in just a second. You're listening to Build Your Best Business. I'm your host, Eric Holtzclaw. We're coming to you live from 3686 in Nashville, Tennessee, talking with Andrew Goldner. He is founding partner at GrowthX. Congratulations, you're your own boss. Now comes the hard part. It's not just about starting a business, it's about successfully managing and growing that business to an eventual exit. And along that entrepreneurial journey, you're going to run into questions and problems that you need quick answers to. Things like, do you need a business plan? How do you read a balance sheet? How do you talk to an investor? When do you bring on a founder? Or what if you're having problems with your partner? These are the types of things that you run into as you're trying to grow that business to the next level, and they may not be the things you want to share in public with other people. They're the problems and issues that arise that as I have experienced on my own entrepreneurial journey, that I needed to have someone I could trust to reach out to and have a conversation and get a different perspective. And it was often those short conversations that would be the thing that moved me from where I was to where I needed to be. It's for that reason I created the On Demand CXO product offering. On Demand CXO is something that you can use to have a conversation with a trust advisor about what's going on in your business. We do a one hour phone call to talk about your business, talk about your objectives, and understand what it's gonna to take to move you from where you are today to where you wanna to be tomorrow. From there, you have ongoing access to a Slack channel 
to ask me questions in private about what's going on in your business so that I can provide some advice or connections to my network to individuals who can help you solve against that problem. You will also have access to my Facebook page, which is full of other entrepreneurs who are along the same journey to have more broad conversations, things that you trust and would talk about in a networking event. But when you need to go and have that conversation with a trusted advisor, you will have the ability to have a conversation with me in a place that's safe, completely anonymous, and unbiased. I want to see you succeed and build your very best business. Talking with Andrew Goldner. He is a partner at our founding partner at GrowthX. I need to make sure I do that right, right? Mm -hmm. He and I are sharing some kind of war stories. We have very similar paths through some of this. So, yes. Yeah. So it's always fun when someone brings up a, a reference like Alta Vista. <laughs> no one, Isaac, David, or Whitney, who are on my production staff, have no idea what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about the transition going from, a lot of people do, they'll move over from being an entrepreneur owner type yeah. person to then deciding they're going to you know, invest money or start to work with people. Why did you do that? How did that look? Yeah. And how did you decide you were going to structure it the way you did? So I've always had the entrepreneur fire in my belly. Um, I just kept finding myself in some interesting opportunities that I wanted to pursue. And so working for the Thompson family for a while through Thompson Financial, and you know, I was blessed by um, a really long and, and interesting career. I, you know, I really owe them a debt of gratitude for the opportunity that they showed me through my seven or eight years from New York to Hong Kong and Singapore from Thompson to Thompson Reuters, yeah. to becoming publisher of Reuters News, 3,000 of what I believe to be the best journalists in the world, and being taught every day inside of the newsrooms, but then bringing entrepreneurial spirit in the newsroom and starting to employ technology as the business of news really started to change. And it was really at the end of that journey in Asia, wanting to come home and really finally wanting to just break out on my own and and kind of really call myself on it, like, all right, are you, are you really an entrepreneur? Or do you really want to say you are, but do it in the comfortable environments of a large company where every two weeks money just shows up in my <laughs> bank account? Right. And so that's when I, um, I left the company and moved back to America and decided to turn myself into a startup and moved to Palo Alto. Okay, wow. And it was really in the so journey. So you went all in. I did, yeah. I did. I went all in and I thought that was really important to do. And I was fortunate enough to have a kernel of community from the early days of the clients that I had been working for. Right. You know, the, the early biz dev professionals at Salesforce did well for themselves. Yeah, they did. And, <laughs> and, 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 and went on and, and the, 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 you know, the early Yahoo folks and the price line and they went on to really do some great stuff and so I reached out and just started making the most of that network, uh, landed in Silicon Valley. And for me, it's always just about how to be helpful. To me, it's never a transaction. It's always a relationship. Right. Knowing that life isn't two parallel lines. It's, it is a wavelength and you come in and out of congruity with people throughout your time on this planet. And if you treat things as a relationship, then you're able to maximize when the opportunities present themselves and not just that single point in time. Yeah. And so landing in the valley and just being helpful, putting myself out there, um, you know, uh, mentoring, advising, uh, took a couple different roles. And I was on a journey of what I wanted to do. Um, and it was just through that time that I was lucky enough um, to meet my, my co-founders, Sean Shepard, uh, who's a, f a former PGA golfer and five-time okay. sales founder, okay. and Will Bunker, who founded what became Match.com. And the three of us came together with a lot of what we were talking about earlier, this similar core belief around uh, developed technology versus applied technology. One of the earliest observations I had when I landed in Silicon Valley is it struck me as interesting that if you were a coder and you start a company, they call you a founder. But if you're a marketer and you start a company, they call you a non-technical founder. Right, right. It's almost, yeah, it's a disadvantage. Oh, it's like a second-class status. Yeah, like, oh, you don't know how to code. And right. I was like, well, that's interesting. And yeah. it, was, it was these similar beliefs, this notion that products are cheaper and easier and the talent's more plentiful, and that it's easier to start a company than grow one. 
Um, and so we came together with the ideas, could we form a venture capital fund where we could deploy not just financial capital, but intellectual capital at scale, um, at the seed stage, um, and actually help the founders. And that's what drew me into venture capital. I, I was never drawn into what I perceived to be or had experienced from venture capital. But when we came up with our own idea around our thesis, around two core beliefs, really, one being that products don't create value, customers do. Yeah. And the corollary, or, the, or, a, or I would say a similar, is that proximity to customer is better than proximity to capitalist. Right. And so for us, we are all about focused on helping early stage founders understand how to solve real market needs, identify real profitable, predictable, scalable revenue, and then just go get more of that type of revenue, because not all revenue is created equally. Right, yeah. And oh, by the way, founders shouldn't have to leave their homes and their friends and their family and the relatively low cost of living and pick up and move to what is the most expensive rat race in America, only to be close to their capitalists. Yeah, yeah. Which is why 11 months ago, I picked up and moved my family from Palo Alto to Nashville. Oh, okay. So now I'm a Nashvillean. Oh, so you're a local. I'm okay. a local now. Yeah, all right. and, it's, and it's because a preponderance of GDP in America is 12 hour drive from Columbus, Ohio. Ah. And that because cheap products are cheaper and easier and that talent is plentiful, if we can engage with local capitalists in places like Nashville and Chattanooga and outside the state, and help them understand a little more about this asset class and how to get involved in a game of chess. Yeah, right. And oh, by the way, our mission is spreading hope and prosperity, and it's through education, entrepreneurism, and innovation. And so these are the things that really drew us in from our backgrounds, you know, as entrepreneurs, as operators, um, to try to do a differentiated venture capital fund where we could roll up our sleeves and actually help our portfolio company to find product market fit and that's our market acceleration program to teach the next generation through a boot camp style school but rather than raising an army of product developers we're raising an army of market developers so yeah. instead of teaching html we're teaching sales and biz dev user experience design and growth marketing and that's growth that's academy and it's for people that want a job in tech but don't want to learn to code. Right, yeah. They understand all the components and know how to test for it, right? Right. Am I getting the right thing? That's right. Has it been built correctly? Those kind of things. And listen, we launched Growth X Academy. We launched the accelerator really just solving our own problem right. as seed stage venture capitalists, seeing that nearly 40% of the companies that fail before they get to their A do so because the founders built something interesting but didn't bother to try to solve a market need. Yeah, it's so interesting. So uh, part of the, my background that I have at shared, I owned a research company from mm. 2002 to mm. 2012 because I fell in love with the concept of usability, working, again, with a Thompson-owned company that you and I talked about. Yep, so front-end customer success. Yeah, the cool thing about a big company is they have the opportunity to fail. So they can put a bunch of money into something. If it doesn't work, they just write it off. But as a person building something, you've gone out and raised somebody else, you've got your own money, you've raised money, you can't. You have to go to market with something that the customer is going to accept and want and use. That's so exactly right. It's so right. much more important, and they put that in the back burner often. I think you're right, and it's a distinction that we like to make as often as we can, because we also have GrowthX Corporate, which is a boutique consulting firm for large public companies, because disruptive innovation, early stage innovation, often gets mistaken for early company stage. Right. It's early product stage. Right, yes. And yes, 100% of what a startup is, is early product stage. Right. Um, and yes, it's often in a race against time and money, but the process you go through works equally as well at a later stage or public company that wants to do something disruptive but part of that really does start with understanding how to build a culture of thoughtful failure, right? Mm -hmm. Fail fast, fail thoughtful forward. Failure. I love it, yeah. How do you be solution agnostic and customer design centric? Yeah. How do you, and, and you know this because you've done it, how do you 
put together some small experiments and help the larger later stage companies reorganize product sales and marketing, especially getting marketing and sales on the, on the entirely different side of the product life cycle. Yeah. Why do you engage with sales and marketing once your engineers have built a product? Absolutely. How did you decide what to put on your product, product yeah. roadmap? Yeah, and there's just so many lessons in all of this, and, and it's so funny that you and I have this kind of common Reuters background, because what I loved about what they did is they, they would divide these, they divided things up, and they sort of made it very entrepreneurial. And you have this money, go do this thing, see if it works or not. And that is something that big, some big, big companies don't do. They won't take the new initiative and put some market, we had marketer, we had the whole group, right? We were like a little bitty startup within a big company. And we had all the benefits of the big company, but we could go off and do stuff like a startup could. You'll see big companies that make the mistake of trying to keep a new product inside, you know, and it can't survive under the politics, it can't survive under the weight of the organization. And at the same time, you have the startup who goes off and builds something and never talks to the customer. They've never, they just build they, it for themselves. They just don't get out of the building. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it's, it is a generation that hasn't been taught how to talk to humans. <laughs> and that right. is oftentimes a differentiator. Mm -hmm. And so that really is 100% of, of why we are doing what we're doing. It's why I picked up and left Palo Alto and moved to Nashville. People always say, well, why, why Tennessee? You know, Palo Alto is a beautiful place, and, and that's the epicenter of, yeah. of venture capital. And I, always, and I love getting the question. I always tell them, well, for me and for Nashville, it's about hopefulness, faithfulness, and happiness. Right? Those are three things that I think really describe the energy of Nashville and the state of Tennessee and the people and what's happening here. Yeah. It's a really three very important things for me when I'm raising my daughters, but they also happen to be three very important nutrients for entrepreneurial soil if you're trying to grow entrepreneurs. Yeah, and if you talk about the world going from transactional to relationship, and the South has always been a relationship. I'm from the South, and so raising money here is different. It's about, even if you're new, we still want to know who you are. Yeah. You know? So we build a relationship. We, you know, watch you for a while, then we might give you a lead or decide. That's right. So that nurturing, and that makes a lot of sense. For it it know, absolutely you does. You know, and I, I, I joke around, you know, in Silicon Valley, uh, people are embarrassed to admit that they attended church or synagogue. Uh, and in Nashville, they're embarrassed to admit they didn't. <laughs> right. Yeah. And point. that really sums up a big difference. And so the approach they take, the conversations that you're having, the ability to engage, the types of problems they're looking to solve, the lack of hubris, and oh, by the way, the reasonable valuations. <laughs> Can I mention that too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean low nor high. I, I'm just talking about a, a valuation that's reasonable in the context of the arc of your entire story and also by, back to that game of chess. Right. Well, it's, I had a conversation with a guy who was very familiar with the West Coast and kind of funding, and he was talking to me about his pride. He was trying to raise money, and I said, so how much revenue have you generated? And he's like, that is such an East Coast question. He's like, that's such a Southeast Coast question. I was like, what do you mean by that? He's, he's like, well, you guys all focus on revenue. If you go to the West Coast, it's how many users do you have? What's your traction? And I'm like, okay, I got it, you know, but. And what's interesting is, is because, you know, we're growth X, so this is kind of what we do. When you, so it's a couple things, some funny stories I would relate. So when I started out investing with growth X, I would often get accused of being a late stage investor cloaked in an early stage fund. <laughs> Why? Because I asked for a financial model. Right. Yeah. And here's the thing, right? There's only one thing I know with 100% certainty at the seed stage and that your numbers are wrong. Uh, yes. But I can I, make a spreadsheet say anything. But here, <laughs> right, exactly. But here's the thing, right? One, I want to see the logic of right. what you're working on. I want to see that you've thought through it and if you're able to actually be one of the few and get through the miracle, yeah. is this even going to be worth it? But you know what I tell founders is, don't build a model for me. Right. Build it for you. Right. You're, you're a smart, capable, thoughtful person. You have one life to live. Before you choose to spend who knows what percentage of the remaining life you have doing something, don't you want to see that if things go okay or if things go badly or if things go well, 
what that might look out for you and is this where you want to be spending your time is this how you want to make your impact so yeah. do it for you first and don't this, create something you hate that's right and you know this is the conversation that i'm so excited to be having you know as often as i'm able to have it around the state of tennessee in the region and other micro hubs which is silicon valley gets to own venture capital there's 500 and some funds yeah. in Silicon Valley. There's only like 600 in the rest of the world combined. If you want to be a venture-capable entrepreneur, the, the, the seed stage, Series A, these are things that get set by Silicon Valley. The pattern recognition in Silicon Valley is unparalleled. But Silicon Valley does not get to own the word entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely not. And this is a mistake that I see starting to happen in places like Tennessee is we cannot completely blend as synonymous venture capable and entrepreneur. So I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and where I grew up, if you started a company from zero to six, seven, eight million dollars of annual revenue every year, you created wealth for yourself and your family. Yeah. You became a respected member of your community and in Silicon Valley, they have a word for you, it's failure. Yeah. And we talk about technical founder, non-technical founder versus non-technical right. founder. I will not allow this notion of lifestyle business. I'm sorry, that is entrepreneur. Right. You cannot create a second class category, right? Lifestyle business is not a pejorative term. Just because I want to work uh, in my own store instead of working in someone else's store doesn't mean that I want to have 19 stores in six cities in two years because maybe I want to spend time with my partner maybe I want to spend time with my kids yeah. maybe I want to volunteer in my community yeah the biggest thing on that is just making sure that you the, the problems I've seen are business partners who don't have that conversation at the beginning and so one wants the Amen. big exit that's something different, another is looking for the lifestyle business, and that becomes the thing, right? And not just your, and that's, I think that's absolutely right, and I would, I would widen it to not just that business partner or founder, but your capitalist. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is the conversation that I have is, are you sure you want to be talking to me? Yeah. Do you know what my objectives are? Yeah. Do you know what my limited partners the people who are funding my fund are expecting from me, right? Don't recruit Barry Bonds unless you're swinging for the fences. Absolutely. And not everybody has to do that. So be thoughtful and intentional about that. Make an educated decision to become a venture-capable entrepreneur. But don't let anybody convince you that lifestyle is a pejorative and don't think that just because you're an entrepreneur that it means therefore you have to raise venture capital. You know, you can also get money from customers. You can, you can bootstrap it. And those work the best. Well, thanks so much for spending time with me. It's been great. So I've been talking with Andrew Goldner, who's founding partner at GrowthX. You've been listening to Build Your Best Business. I'm your host, Eric Holtzkaw. We focus on the entrepreneurial journey. What does it take to successfully start, manage, grow, and maybe eventually exit a business, if that's where you're headed. Now, what are you gonna do to build your best business? Every day, you wake up as your own boss, making your own way. Every day, you continue your journey to change the world, your team, and yourself. Every day, you encourage, congratulate, celebrate, and reach toward your goal of being the best and providing the best. The Build Your Best Business Show is for you. The real stories of building a business from other owners and founders along the journey. Find the support and advice you need to successfully start, grow, manage, and exit your business. What are you going to do today to build your best business?